Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul Series in Kerbal Space Program 0 .90 Beta. In this episode I've begun by updating many many mods. Uh, most of the ones that begin with R. Realism Overhaul is at 8.3.1. Real Fuels is at version 9.0. RP0, the tech tree, is at 0.29. And Real Solar System is at 8.6.1. So that's just for reference. Uh, so far so good in that uh, the the landscape actually loads up, so that's okay. Uh, it's still dark though, and I swear this is the only series... Uh, I've got many many Realism Overhaul installs, and this is the only one where the terrain is so dark. I, I still wonder why. Uh, of course, this is the only one that is in career mode, perhaps? Uh, maybe that's the thing, because of course the KSC is different in career mode. Uh, let's take a look at our possible contracts. So what we've got active is we still need to rescue a Kerbal and we need to uh, land on the moon and recover scientific data from the surface of the moon. Uh, that seems to be the more exciting possibility to me right now. But I also mentioned that I wanted to ooh, perform temperature scans. Oh, that's that specific locations in flight. If it was on the surface, that would be a breeze. I mean, at least uh, it would be obvious to do that with this. Um, Science data from space around the moon. I guess we should pick that up. If we're going to land on the moon, we're bound to be able to do some science in space, right? Hopefully. Um, no, this is more specific. The more specific stuff at specific sites, I'm not too keen on right now. Now, I wanted to aim for a satellite contract, either this polar orbit one. Let's see. Uh, longitude of ascending node 90.1 degrees. Oh, that that should be very interesting, actually. We would have to launch. Uh, well, hmm. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm. It's early in the morning. I'm probably thinking about this all wrong. Let me pick it up, and we'll try it out, and then I'll see what what I what what this is all about. I think. Uh, uh, I'll sacrifice the price in order to see exactly what the what the whole situation is. Explore Duna. Uh, yeah, we'll have to do that. It never expires. So, but then again, we're we're coming up on our contract limit. But yeah, now we've got two Molnia contracts that are. Well, this one has longitude ascending node 220.4 degrees. This one has it at negative 183 degrees. Those aren't compatible. Those don't add up to 360 in any way. They're not too far off, but they're not the same. Argument of periapsis is opposite as well. So best to just take one, I suppose. And why not uh, take the more lucrative one, which is this one. Okay, so now what I need is a launcher that can do moon missions, that can do polar orbits of this height, and that can launch something into a Molnia orbit. Uh, first, I, I, have a, I have a moon probe in mind. Uh, let me show you that. Okay, so behold, rinse wind. This is uh, my intended uh, lunar probe to land on the moon. Uh, you notice antenna on top, antennas on the sides. Uh, it'll have to land on its engine because, frankly, uh, A, uh, the landing struts will be too heavy. B, they're also non-RP0 as far as the ones that we can unlock. So part not supported by RP0, so what, what's the point? And anyway, if we put uh, even three on, that's 0.225 tons. And this probe is 0.4 tons. It's right at the limit for its avionics. If I just turn this up a little bit, oh, problem. Right. So uh, now we have this avionics display to show us when we're going to be having a problem. It's, it's got two of these early controllable cores, and so those are, well, they, they suck up a bit of juice, but, I mean, they, they take three electric charge per minute, which is why this only has a seven-day lifespan, uh, even with these four solar panels arrayed as they are. 
but uh, that's enough. Seven days to get to the moon is quite enough. So yeah, uh, so it's gonna have to land on its engine and hopefully these antennae will sort of prop it as it tips over. Um, either way, I think the probe cores will survive, which is the important thing. And you notice I put the experiments on the top. Now communication for them will be a little bit tricky. We probably should send some some uh, satellites around the moon before we send this because otherwise we won't be able to communicate with it on the ground. Um, so that's a very important consideration. Also this won't be able to get to, I mean it's a little bit tight on uh, trying to land this on the surface all on its own. Uh, it'll probably need some uh, descent help from another stage and of course it has to be able to transfer to the moon uh, so that's separate. But anyway this is the Rincewind probe again naming after Terry Pratchett characters and so yeah uh, but the key thing now is the launcher and when it comes to that I need to unlock some stuff I think uh, for instance well I, I wanted to hesitate on unlocking some of the more advanced engines but I might not get that chance taking a look at it now of course the most tempting one is the RL10 series because uh, with that, uh, even at the base level, 422 vacuum ISP, and of course uh, later on we get much better ISPs down the road. And of course this one is a very nice model of it. So yeah, oh they're sort of separate aren't they? That's inconvenient. So uh, instead of being able to buy uh, one and get both, I have to buy them each separately even though they're same, the same engine. That's, well, I mean, what can you do, right? But uh, yeah, that's a very advanced engine, even though it came early in actual uh, human history. So I'm a little bit hesitant on that, but I suppose since we have it, we also could unlock the J2, which is pretty powerful stuff. I'm just reading the description here, and it says, uh, RS-27A has a higher area ratio since it's not ignited until SRV burnout on the Delta II. Did not realize that. Um, probably should fix that. I mean, my in my today in space history uh, series, I've been lighting it on the ground. Huh. Okay. Anyway, uh, but that is a separate thing. So anyway, let me try and put together a launcher for for this moon probe as well as you know. I mean, there's no point uh, messing around with it. Uh, we could use this as a satellite, right? There's no problem with using it as our main satellite. We've got all the antennas we could ask for. Uh, at least we don't have... Like, hmm. This is a very helpful antenna. Maybe we should unlock that and add that to a dedicated uh, satellite instead of using this. How much electric charge? doesn't cost too much electric charge. Okay, let me think about it. All right, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go, and what we have here is the Hogfather, and that is going to be our polar satellite. Hogfather, of course, is the Discworld version of Santa Claus, and so naturally it makes sense to name our polar satellite that. And so here we go. We've got four of these little early controllable cores, giving us a capacity of 0.8 tons for the main satellite. We've got uh, all the solar panels that we need, I think. And we've got one of the long-range uh, antennas that I unlocked, and so that's got a range that would cover the moon, though we seem to have no trouble communicating out to the moon anyway with just a commutron and four of these. But uh, just in case, we will have that along. And yep, yeah, we've got little RCS ports. We also have the first use of reaction wheel I unlocked the reaction wheel, it says that it is placed properly in RP0 but it doesn't have the right cost. But I think at the cost of 600, it's probably more than it should be. So I think it's fair enough because after all uh, our RCS blocks seem to be fairly cheap and even our uh, control cores, for instance this Able Delta Avionics or the Agena one that I'm going to be using is, uh, you know, within the same range so I don't think it's too far off alright and so we have a one kilonewton thruster here burning MMHN 204 which is there 
and if we take a look at delta v stats uh, this itself has 1900 already so but and this launch is going to be more than we need for a polar satellite because of course there's the same launcher that I'm going to use to send over the moon lander the lunar lander so I want to make sure that this all works and so what I've created is a Relina which is a, a Gina avionics package with an RL10 here so we have unlocked the RL10 that is the only new engine I unlocked and we are using the base version of it, the RL10 A1. Uh, so that should be interesting. It still has restarts. It still has five restarts, which is essential because we are going to need to use it to finish off our orbit. And then we need to restart it, relight it in order to uh, head to our higher orbit or the moon in the case of the lunar adventure. Okay, it also has. RCS ports and, and NMH N204 for those. So let's just make sure this is configured properly. This is a service module, highly pressurized and everything. Uh, this one is just a normal cryogenic tank. And so yes, we've got uh, 8 minute and 20 uh, 8 minute and 20 second stage there. And that should be enough for the moon, but we'll have to see. It's a little bit tight, I think. Um, in any case, we've got this uh, stage which is just four of the one kilonewton thrusters that would be able to finish any lunar transit also get into orbit around the moon and start the descent so that's the purpose of this stage which is very underpowered in terms of thrust to weight ratio but considering what it's doing it's all right okay and so Agena core which uh, now the reason I picked the Agena instead of the Able Delta even though the Able Delta is lighter and 8 tons is not too bad, uh, is because of electric charge. You notice electric charge consumption here, 15 units per minute. This one, 60 units per minute. There's just no way I can get enough solar panel re on board in order to cover that 60 units per minute. So it had to be this one. Now, I better check my electric charge on this because I, uh, I built all this around the rinse wind instead of building it around the Hogfather. I just attached it. So let me just double check. Well, four days is enough time. So uh, that that's all right. Uh, even though it is more, more electric charge draw than I would have liked. But four days is enough. Okay, so we can package that up. So RL10, uh, this is the main guidance unit for the core. 120 ton capacity there and so that that's enough to handle the main stack and the first stage alright and we also have supplementary guidance units on each of the boosters and you see we now have four boosters and but they're shaped similarly to the to the Telemon 4 which is why it is Telemon 5 and those are one meter ones and so they have a capacity of 45 tons apiece and that's how we get to our total capacity of 312 tons. Now, instead of having the LR-105 in the center, we, we wouldn't have enough thrust if we tried to do that. We have uh, the boosters all around. So we're using LRA-9, NA, actually it should be NA-6s all, uh, all, all around. Yeah. Okay, so we've, we've got that going for us. And so the... All of this burns about, let's say, 8,800, and then we will need to use, is that right? No, 7,800, 7,800. Hmm, my numbers seem a little bit off, but it'll be all right for this mission. I think it's because the actual, uh, the Hogfather is heavier than the Rincewind, that's why. Um, if, uh, if we add the Rincewind on, I think the numbers will work out better. Okay. So, obviously, this is not going to the moon. All right, well, let's see if we can get this to to a polar orbit. Um, trying to pick a launch site, the thing is, let me take a look at the map and try and figure out this longitude of ascending node thing. Okay, all right, so this is what they want. Let's see what direction they want to go in. Uh, up that way, down this way. Where are we now? We're over here. Uh, actually, 
Uh, it, we are at Cape Canaveral, but uh, it thinks uh, this has it marked as here. Um, doesn't really matter. Well, I guess, let's see. I don't want to do a nighttime launch. I want to launch southerly. Maybe we should launch out of Vandenberg then. Yeah, so uh, it'll be daylight in Vandenberg when we would have to launch heading down. Is that right? Yeah. So we'll head south out of Vandenberg. We'll, of course, we'll have to be a little bit uh, west of south to cancel out our easterly momentum thanks to the rotation of the planet. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's, let's go with that. Where are you, Vandenberg? And let me time warp so that we are underneath this intended orbit for the polar satellite. Okay, that should have us about right. All right, let's launch. Oh my. Frame rates are not great. Physics feels iffy. We're 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 getting to I guess this is what the game at least on my computer now considers a big rocket. RAM is not good. We're at 3.5 gigabytes now. Is it safe to launch? Will it crash on me? Well, let's try it. It's only probably about thirty thousand funds or something like that. Yeah, let's let's go, and we'll see about that. All right. I haven't had to add vernier thrusters, but those are probably necessary at some point, right? So we want to go south. Let's have it execute roll right now. This is Vandenberg, right? Well, we're, we're going to find out soon enough. Well, landscape's still very dark. Well, it's early morning yet. And, uh, yeah, that's right, early morning. Okay, the game crashed at that point. We are standby to launch again. But I have to make sure that we're, like, at the right location. So, let, let me just pick a random location and then go back to Vandenberg. Okay. Now let's try to fly this. Okay, well, uh, frame rates are no better. But uh, before loading the craft, uh, we were at 2.8 gigabytes of RAM. We are now at 3.1. We'll see if that holds out. Anyway, throttle up and here we go again. Okay, well, all looks well except for the fact that it's really, really loud for me. These are particularly loud engines, apparently. Well, I'll be thankful to get rid of the boosters once we can, just to get some frame rates and uh, physics rates. Um, You know, there's absolutely no reason for us to aim for a low apoapsis at this point. Maybe we should boost directly to the high apoapsis that we've got. Uh, we need... That's Molnia. Where's Polar? 
Ah, uh, here we go. 11,000 kilometers. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have to flatten out. We certainly do. Oh, uh, 75 should have been next. Alright, we are past... Well, we're passing Mach 1. Finally getting close to the coastline, though it's really difficult to see it. There's blue on this side here. There's black. That's quite a plume. Since my frame rates were already bad before I even lit the engines, I don't think smokescreen is causing any of my problems. Alright, well, inclination and longitude of ascending node numbers are tending towards the right direction. Actually, longitude of ascending node is changing so fast, I'm worried that we might end up with less than 90 degrees. Okay, here we go through the area of heating, and I'm maintaining a higher pitch deliberately here because I'm worried about the decouplers. If you recall, the decouplers tended to overheat in this area, and we've got a lot more fuel in the boosters than we did before, so they're going to last longer. Now, last before, I used to be able to just decouple them, and that alleviated the overheating, but this time I can't do that. Oh, oh, de oh dear, here we go. Uh, so I'll just keep it at this pitch in the hope that I can have those decouplers survive. I didn't tweak scale them. They're, they're, they're the default thing. And the other decouplers, I have an, uh, another set that I could unlock. Those have the same heat tolerance. So I don't know. I don't think going to those would help. It looks like maybe maintaining this pitch will be alright. Still not cooling off. I thought they would by 40 kilometers. have to go to 40 degrees at lips. 40 degrees at least at this point. Okay, well they're cooling off now. Let's get it to 35 before the boosters run out. Okay, let's see if the separatrons can do their thing. Interesting sound for those. All right, well, they, they've done their thing, all right. And so this continues. We've got fine acceleration through this stage again because we swapped out the LR-105 for the LR-89, I think it is. So let's take a quick look at the map. So we're going like this. Uh, where is the target? Well, it's way out there, sort of. And we're sort of lined up with it. We're actually a little bit early, I think. Our longitude of ascending node is going lower than what I wanted. The question is what kind of tolerance I have on that. The contracts seem to be very liberal on these things, but it's tough to say exactly how far I can go off from the intended amount. And of course, doing this right now is also decreasing the rate at which my inclination heads towards 90. Yeah, I don't. I, I think I'd rather be off on the longitude of ascending node than on the inclination. Let's go back to 185. Though I guess keeping some sort of inclination might serve to help us out to fix the longitude of ascending node. Okay, fairing separation time. 
Okay, they look clear. Let me get to the top antenna and extend it just for safety's sake. I don't know what kind of tracking stations we have out here on this coast. So the most critical test uh, will be whether the small RCS ports that I'm using will be able to help relight the RL-10. The question is whether they can help settle the fuels down for a relight. Not sure about that. They're pretty weak considering the mass of these things. Our longitude of ascending note is really going off. Or if I can, would this actually reverse it? Yes, it does. But it also reverses the inclination. Uh, oh boy. Again, I'd rather just have the inclination right. And even if this, if we f fail on this contract the first time, this will be a very useful satellite to have for lunar communications. In fact, I'm going to tell it to do that right now. Gonna have this dish target the moon. Well, this is certainly the first time I've tried putting a satellite into polar orbit under contract with these requirements. I'm sure you can tell. Okay, this stage is about to run out. And there's the RL-10 with its very, very faint blue flame. I actually had to up that for my mission control series with the WK-10 version simply because the flame was so light and indistinct it was not dramatic enough. Okay, we're passing Apoapsis here which is just fine. And that's because we're going to continue burning until uh, the orbit on our opposite side goes all the way up to 11,000 kilometers. So we're just going to be, uh, we're on our way down, but uh, we're going to be burning for quite a while to go. Uh, we've got about 0.6 degrees left on our inclination to get to 90. Uh, on our longitude of ascending node, it looks like we're going to be about 3 degrees off which is, you know, less than 1% off if you take all 360 degrees, but I don't think any particular company would be really happy with that. But the question is whether the program will be particularly happy with that. Actually, uh, we need 90.1 degrees on longitude of ascending node, so we're getting pretty close to that 3 degree mark. Okay, so we've had the camera change, and that means we are in orbit. Now we're really in orbit, but uh, and going like this, of course. So maybe 2,400 meters per second left on this stage. Uh, that's not really why what I wanted for the moon trip, but then again, the payload is is a little bit heavier. But maybe need to look into those numbers a bit. So, if a correction does have to be done for the longitude of ascending node, I guess we would have to wait until we cross the equator. The equator will be where our ascending or descending node would be. We'd have to tilt our inclination a little bit off from 90, and then that would give us a chance to adjust our, our longitude of ascending node, and then we'd have to readjust back to 90. And of course, if we were, we were very far out at 11,000 kilometers, uh, the inclination change probably won't be too bad. We certainly have enough Delta V on board. One trouble is the, the RL-10 stage is going to end up being lighter than it would for a moon trip because we're burning more. I mean, obviously for the moon trip we would get into orbit first and then we'd have to relight with a heavier RL-10 stage 
because we were just in orbit and not boosting to such a high apoapsis. So maybe the RCS thrusters will be enough here, but might not be enough for a fuller stage, I don't know. That's a consideration. Okay, getting ready to shut down the engine now. Okay, 11,062 kilometers. Pretty close. We'll have to probably use the 1 kN thrusters to fine tune it if we need to go there. Alright, so let's go up there, circularize, and that will entail restarting this engine. And if the engine doesn't restart, we'll still be able to use this stage to finish the orbit up. But uh, this is what we look at right now, look look like right now. Uh, there you see the gap. Not very pleasant. Should still have communication, should still have power. Okay, so let's... Let's deactivate these upper tanks just to be safe. Sometimes it just doesn't draw from them, but I want to make sure of that. Okay, head to node with RCS available to you. Oh, you went overboard. You went overboard. Smart ASS. Sheesh. Let's see the status of our fuel. Very stable, it claims. Maybe the turn shook it up a little bit. Well, don't know if that was a particularly good test, but here we go. We're currently on the nighttime side, so we don't have... Well, no, we have an okay view of Earth. Okay, that's that. And like these. Uh-oh. What? Oh, right. <laughs> Gotta unlock the tank, yes. Okay, very good. And probably... Uh, well, it looks pretty stable right now, but really... Yeah, it'll, it'll deviate without some RCS help. Now, despite having plenty of fuel remaining, we'll have to dump this. Or de- well, well, yeah, we'd have to dump it. It drains too much electric charge. Deactivating wouldn't be good because we wouldn't be able to control it. We, we don't have enough controllers. Why is one controller bigger than the others? Huh. Okay, it says we're in the designated orbit, but I'll, I'll give them something a little bit closer than this. This is still a bit off. And if they're willing to accept the longitude of ascending node, I'll at least give them a decent apoapsis and periapsis here. It's not really throttleable. Let, let me shut down here. I think that's about the average of what they want. So when we say maintain stability, I think it'd be best to take RCS and SAS off. Let's see. Or maybe SAS will help. I forget if SAS helps stability. Okay, we've got it. We fulfilled that contract. 320,000, like 10 times more than the cost of this launch, 18 science as well. Um, but if we want this to be a persistent satellite, we're going to need to dump this, otherwise it's not going to have enough power. So, uh, sorry, remaining Agena stage, bye-bye. Okay, now we're in the nighttime side. Oh, uh, we can put SAS on. So, well, I don't know. I guess we could turn off some of these guys. Hmm. Doesn't seem to change the drain. Should do, right? 
they do cause some can I no longer control this now or what oh boy hold on this is strange I have control over some things, I think, but not all things. I can't activate RCS. Can I activate the stage? No. And I can't actually deactivate this thing's avionics, so I've lost control over this. <laughs> um, but, but, I seem to be able to wiggle it around. Yep, I can definitely wiggle it around. Isn't that the one thing I shouldn't be able to control? Hmm. Okay, well this is not working the way I thought it would. That's point two charge. This is zero. Zero. It's gotta be the probe cores that are actually using the charge I thought shutting this down it was supposed to turn off the watt usage when you deactivate avionics it's supposed to not have the same power draw right but it still shows that it has the same power draw this this 20 drain is all these it should have gone down to 15 when I deactivate avionics and I'm annoyed now because now I can't control this thing. Or apparently can't. Okay, so that doesn't work the way I thought it would. Uh, five days worth of electric charge. Don't know how that'll do. I guess it's not so useful, but at least we got the funds out of it. Alright, so. Uh, we'll say the first Hogfather Polar Communication Satellite. Launched successful. Contract fulfilled. Um some issues around here but we can deal with that uh, overall a great success meaning that we can probably use the same launcher for the Molnia orbit mission and then also the same launcher for our moon landing all right so with that and with those things to look forward to i'll say thank you for watching if you enjoyed this video please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and i'll see you next time